Hello, everybody. My name is Dominic Sachsenmeier. Um, I'm a professor of uh, Chinese and global history at the University of Göttingen. And it's my great honor to have this distinguished and wonderful panel here to talk about the idea of conceptualizing planetary humanities uh, with us. And I'm co-hosting this event together with uh, Bo Strat of the Academy of Finland and the University of Helsinki, as well as John Noyes uh, of the University of Toronto and uh, Stellenbosch uh, University. And this event is also hosted as part of a project uh, research network dealing with world making that Göttingen University does together with the universities of Heidelberg, the Free University of Berlin and Würzburg that is sponsored by the Ministry of uh, Education and Research. And as part of this project, Mrs. Uh, Zhao Xiaoyang and uh, Janice Jung helped us to prepare this event. And uh, we are very happy and thankful for all the work they have uh, done. And the topic uh, today of this two-part uh, panel, I mean, this afternoon and tomorrow morning, Central European time, is planetary humanities. And we all know that, I mean, there's a problem with the configuration of knowledge uh, in academia in general and uh, in the humanities in particular. And of course, there's many other problems and challenges surrounding uh, modern academia uh, in its current shape. And we all know that, of course, there are many global challenges and problems. I mean, of course, we all, uh, just to name two, um, the obvious examples, the global environmental crisis, and of course, the, well, in gr growing block formation, block building, uh, and uh, conflictual situation at a, at a global level. And I think what we want to do here is maybe to launch something like an experiment and reflect to reflect upon new ways, well, to go beyond academic specialization and the usual academic, well, uh, 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 problems and, uh, and specialization. Uh, and that's why we invited like a group of really distinguished scholars representing different academic fields and uh, who are based and familiar with different parts of the world. And uh, our chair, uh, Selchuk Isenbell, is uh, going to introduce uh, the, the panelists before uh, their presentation. But it is my honor to uh, introduce uh, Professor Isenbell. She is a professor of uh, history at the Department of History at Boazici University in Istanbul. And uh, she's the founding director and academic coordinator of the Asian Studies Center at Istanbul. She is a great authority in Japanese history and its global context, also with uh, its, uh, the relationship between uh, Japan and the history of modern Islam. And she has uh, won many uh, research awards, including the Order of the Rising Sun, uh, uh, the Jap Japan Foundation Special Prize for Japanese Studies, and an Alexander von Humboldt uh, Georg Foster Research Award. So welcome everybody again to this panel. And uh, please, Selchuk, uh, uh, if you take over as the conference chair now. Well, Thank it's you. a great uh, honor and pleasure to chair uh, this uh, uh, opening session. Uh, I will immediately uh, <clears throat> move on to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dibesh Chakrabarti, is the Lawrence A. Kimpton Distinguished Service Professor of History and South Asian Studies at the University of Chicago. He's also a faculty fellow of the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory and has a courtesy appointment in the School of Law of the University of Chicago. His publications include Provincializing Europe, Postcolonial Thought and Historical Difference. Uh, this is required reading, by the way, Professor Chakrabarti in my historiography course, just so that <laughs> to let you know, and the climate of history in a planetary age that came out quite recently in 2021. He's also a founding member of the editorial collective of subaltern studies, a consulting editor of critical inquiry, a founding editor of postcolonial studies, and has served on the editorial boards of the American Historical Review and Public Culture. Chakravarti is the recipient of the 2014 Toynbee Foundation Prize for his contributions to global history and of the 2019 Tagore Memorial Prize awarded by the government of West Bengal for his book, The Crises of Civilization. Uh, Professor Chakravarti, the floor is yours. Uh, you I need to, I have to, to unmute, uh, yes, yeah. unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank okay. you, Professor Sinbel. Thank you, Professor Sinbel, 
for the warm introduction and thank you to my good friends Bo and Dominique for the invitation to be to present on this panel. I've got about four pages written out, which I'll read out, and I hope I'll, that will help me to stay within my uh, allotted 10 to 15 minutes. <clears throat> the word humanity, the dictionary tells us, has existed in the English language since the early 18th century, with roots going back to the late Middle Ages, signifying a class of studies concerned with human culture and distinguished from studies of the sacred. Uh, I guess in Latin, literae human, humaniores, distinguished from literae divine. By the late 16th century, the word humanist meant a student of the classical humanities, one accomplished in literature and classical literature. From the 19th century, the word plural word humanities has signified in English the old sense of studies concerned with human culture and distinguished from both divinity and science studies. The contemporary American expression is liberal studies that is often accepted globally as a way of describing a version of this heritage in the neoliberal, global, and often private or corporate universities coming up in many countries in Asia, for instance, in India, China, South Korea, Singapore, and elsewhere. The heritage is undoubtedly Western and of relatively recent invention. In India, there's such usage, usage of the classical heritage goes back to early 19th century, when the British used their classical literature mediated by figures from the English Renaissance, like Milton and Shakespeare, and used later Enlightenment thinkers as the basis of their claim to civilizational superiority, and therefore to their claim to rule. The Indian university system established by the British accepted this version of the humanities and sought to accommodate within it textual traditions available in Sanskrit, Persian, Arabic, and in the vernacular languages with some unhappy consequences, may I say. It has long been recognized that this understanding of the humanities remains Eurocentric and text-centric and therefore does not serve very well the vast groups of humans who either produce textual materials outside of the European provenance of the humanities or did not produce texts in the written form. In the last few decades, we have sought to use words like global or plural to broaden the intellectual, to broaden the intellectual consequences of the different kinds of colonial domination and oppression unleashed on the world as European powers both expanded their rule outside Europe and also technologically and otherwise brought this world together to create both literally and metaphorically the globe and our global view of the planet. For several decades, it seems to me the world globe and the planet were used more or less as synonyms is in European humanistic studies, for instance, in Carl Schmitt's use of these words in his Nomos of the Earth. Today, however, these words have acquired somewhat different resonances. These resonances are not so, are not so uniform as to enable us to say that there is only one set of distinctions that marks the area of difference between the two words, the globe and the planet. But clearly we feel the need to use the word planetary today to distinguish something other than the global, to no matter how differently we understand the difference between the global and the planet. In my recent work on the humanistic implications of the sciences of climate change and the science that is behind the claim that there is enough evidence in the strata of the planet to suggest that it has entered a new geological epoch, variously called the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene or other names, that is the science called the earth system science, to be precise. In studying that science, I have made a distinction between the globe and the planet in a particular way and have proposed that the word planet, by which I mean the earth system of earth system science, I propose that the word planet has now emerged as a humanist category, expressive of many human concerns around anthropogenic climate change and the consequent threat to both human civilization and biodiversity that is to life in general on the planet. From this point of view, I've suggested that the globe has been made possible by European empires, new world slavery, colonial rule, the decimation and permanent colonization of indigenous peoples, the rise of global technology. The globe therefore is a humanocentric story. Humans are the protagonists of this story. Intensification of extractive and global capitalism, however, 
and the Cold War politics of space competition between the superpowers expose scientists and through them now scholars in the humanities to the domain of the planetary, the view of the earth as a system, a planet on which geological and biological processes come together to maintain life for billions of years and complex multicellular life for 5 million years in spite of five great extinctions. <laughs> The planet, the Earth system, is an abstract human construction, but it tells the story of deep time and deep history, and it necessarily decenters humans. In the geological and biological histories of this planet, humans come just too late to be at the center of the story. While the story of the globe is necessarily about the politics of class, race, gender, indigeneity, and all the other anthropological differences that we legitimately privilege in our aspirations for just for justice and equality or even sustainability, which is itself a human-centered conception. The fury of the planet, manifested as earthquakes, tsunami, warming and acidification of the seas, loss of marine biodiversity and the general threat of species extinctions, large-scale deforestation, and the coming, as Anthony Fauci keeps saying, of an era of zoonotic pandemics, that kind of planetary fury reduces us to our creaturely lives where even the power conferred on some by their wealth and military technology only increases their brutish, and I use this sense with all its Hobbesian resonances, only increases their brutish capacity for survival. The planetary is about waking up to the shocking otherness of the planet as distinct from the Heideggerian categories of the earth and the world. This is of course not the only way to speak about the planet as a category of human concern. Humans have always and everywhere been concerned with the planetary aspects of their lives. When humans settled in the Pacific, for instance, negotiating the oceans, they guided themselves by their knowledge of the stars and the skies. Old Indian or Greek astrology or even astronomy represented ways of thinking that one could call planetary. Concerns in peasant societies about the seasons are in a sense planetary concerns. Even some of the everyday fatic utterances how are you? Isn't it a lovely day? Refer to the domain of the planetary. Often it refers to the sea of infectious microbes that we swim in. The work of the sun, the air, the clouds, the trees and everything. And in recent times, <clears throat> Paul Gilroy, Ashin Membe, Walter Mignolo, Gayatri Spivak and others have used the word planetary in different and overlapping ways. This plurality of the category planetary has to be recognized and acknowledged. But there is one difference I wish to point out between the history of humans' planetary concerns and the concerns gathered by Earth system sciences category of the planet or the Earth as a system, which is how I'm using it here. This category planet <coughs> refers to work to the work. That's parts of this planet that humans have never directly experienced and pro probably never will. The role that the deep oceans, the deep earth, including tectonic shifts, tiny oceanic life forms like planktons, the Siberian places like the and, and phenomena like the Siberian permafrost, the polar ice caps, the conveyor belt of the North Atlantic Ocean, the roles that all these things play in maintaining the climate system of the planet as a whole and on which life depends. The planetary climate system is an abstract construction based on big data, climate modeling, etc. It is somewhat like what Timothy Morton calls a hyperobject. You cannot bump into it, but it can have the impact of a huge object like the asteroid, for instance, that made the dinosaurs extinct. Yet this abstraction, the planet or the Earth system, gives rise not only in us, but also in the scientists who study the Earth system science, it gives rise to existential concerns and questions today. Will human civilization survive? Do high-tech civilizations necessarily abort themselves? Will humanity survive? Do we need a civilizational change? And so on. These are questions and concerns that belong properly to the humanities. And for that reason, I suggest that this new planet, the Earth system of Earth system science, is also a humanist category worthy of reflection in humanistic studies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'm moving on. Uh, let me introduce uh, Rochana Majumdar, is Associate Professor in the Departments of South Asian Languages and Civilizations 
and Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago. She's also a faculty affiliate of the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, the Nicholson Center for British Studies, and the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality at the University of Chicago. Majumdar is the author of Marriage and Modernity, Duke University Press, 2009, Writing Postcolonial History, Bloomsbury, 2010, and Art Cinema and India's Forgotten Futures, forthcoming Columbia University Press, 2021. In addition, she has co-edited two volumes from the colonial to the post-colonial uh, Oxford University Press, 2007, and Civilization, Civilizing Emotions, again, Oxford University Press, 2015. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Essenbell. So I'm also going to read in the interests of uh, keeping to the time that has been allotted to us. I have rape colored skin. My light brown blackness is a living testament to the rules, the practices, the causes of the old South. These haunting lines by the poet Carolyn Randall Williams were published on June 26, 2020, just two days shy of a year from, from today, actually, when uh, North America and indeed the world was in a paroxysm of the novel coronavirus, and America in particular was also gasping from, from a paroxysm of widespread civil unrest. Bearing on her skin the history of unequal racial relations and sexual relations, a history of slavery and white oppression, Williams is an embodiment of post-colonial hybridity. The lines, as I noted, appeared at the height of the deadly uh, pandemic. I draw attention to the juxtaposition of these two factors, civil social strife and the deadly virus, because they underscore the changes that concern post-colonial and decolonial theory in the 21st century. The figure of the human, fissured by anthropological differences of race, caste, gender, sexuality, caste, religion, have been at the center of post-colonial theory since it first emerged in the Anglo-American Academy in the 1980s. Since then, this body of work's commitment to thinking about human difference and oppositional thinking has only deepened. But these concerns have been rendered more challenging and complicated in the last decade by a rising awareness of humanity as the structuring force of the epoch identified as the Anthropocene. Exercising geological agency, humans are now held responsible for climate forcings that can alter the world's temperature, glacial composition, wildlife, wildlife habitat, and many other changes whose impact is emergent. What does it mean to be undertaking a post or decolonial analysis with an awareness of the Anthropos, both as dominant species and as an entity riven by differences and inequalities is the challenge for post-colonial theory. And indeed it's the subject of my new work where I wish to stage and engage in a conversation and a comparison between post and decolonial theory in the 21st century. For the purposes of my remarks today, I'm going to be focusing more on post-colonial theory and I cannot say what an honor it is to actually be sharing the floor with, uh, with so many leading post and decolonial thinkers whose work I've been reading and look forward to reading more in, in, in this coming year. Now, as I said, um, during the 1980s and 90s, difference was a key theme in post-colonial theory. When it made its appearance in the Anglo-American Academy, this body of work seemed opposite to the post-Fordist formerly decolonized world. Our current historical conjuncture can be described very schematically as one where runaway globalization and the expansion of finance capital on the one hand and severe environmental catastrophes 
have produced new anxieties and precariousness in both human and non-human lives. I mean, they've been doing that for some time, but I would say that what distinguishes our times from the 1980s and 90s is an increasing, is, is an awareness of these factors. The awareness, this awareness of the conjoined fate of humanity and other species between man with a capital M and human, to use Sylvia Winters's uh, distinction, informs the academic temper of our times and indeed the humanistic temper of our times. Postcolonial theory has registered these changes. The postcolonial theorization of difference remains highly relevant, perhaps more relevant than ever before, but it must now be considered, considered in tandem with the planetary and the post-human term. But what does the planet or the neologism that it has given rise to the planetary mean? Now, Dipish alluded to the different ways in which the planetary has been registered in by humanistic thinkers. And let me just allude to some of them who really come out of the post-colonial stable. In, in my reading, one of its earliest usages occurs uh, in, in in Gayatri Spivak's Death of a Discipline, 2003, where Spivak deployed the planet to critique what she called a cartographic reading dominant in the field of world literature, where translation into a global tongue, English or sometimes French, is regarded as a gesture of equity. Against the presumption of such equivalence and fungibility, Spivak posited the planet as something in the species of alterity distinct from such categories as the uh, continental or global or worldly. She proposed that the planet overwrite the globe in a critical gesture seeking out from the regime of global capital see, or see, as, a, as an out from the regime of global capital and its disciplinary protocols. So I think it's important to see here that, that Spivak's critique was, was as much a critique of global capitalism, but also its disciplinary protocols as it impacts us in, in the humanities, among, among other disciplines. Now, since then, I, it seems to me, uh, as, as somebody coming into the field as, as a post-colonial um, theorist, the expression planet and planetarity has become really policy -make. So one of the things that Spivak said at the time was she, she pushed back against what she called the unexamined environmentalism and planet talk. It's interesting that between 2003 and now, environment, nature, energy, and climate have emerged as central to post-colonial planet talk. For example, in Paul Gilroy's Tanner lectures, 2014, he brought together planetarity with the politics of race. Gilroy signaled toward a planetary opening up of the Black Atlantic now that the gray vault of the sea is rising and smaller boats, flee, uh, smaller boats sweep fleeing Africans northward towards a fortified Europe rather than westward into the colonial nomos of the plantation economy. So he brings together the new migrant precariousness with the history of the Middle Passage and advocates a new planetary human humanism, the birth of new solidarities and collectivities that envision new human groupings as sea levels rise and fortifications placed around the citadels of what he calls overdevelopment. So there's a continuum he sees between his own ideas of the Black Atlantic and of such post-colonial thought as embodied in Amy Cesare's and the new conditions of neoliberal capitalist exploitation against which he posits a planetary humanism as a metaphor for oppositional thinking that would, be, that would measure up to these new conditions. Now Spivak presented the planet as alterity. If Gilroy uh, is advocating for a planetary humanism, I think Ashil Mbembe posits the planetary as 
and Ashil, please, I mean, it's, it's strange to be referring to you with you here, so correct me, but it's absolutely inspiring to see the way you invoke the planetary as a cosmology in what you call the becoming black of the world. Blackness in my reading of you is, is a figure of the oppressed and an overcoming of, the condition, of that condition, a figure of post-colonial becoming and sublation. Professor Mbembe marks three moments in world history, the Atlantic slave trade from the 15th to the 19th century, the birth of revolutionary writing near the end of the 18th century and the 21st century moment of globalization and privatization. These three epochs coincide, he writes, with the capture and thingification of black life the revolt and rehumanization of black life and the reactive financialization and equalization of black lives, which together signal this becoming black of the world. I'm fully with Ian Baucom's analysis of this new work, which he calls a planetary animism as marking an inaugural moment in a critical humanities in which in Mbembe's eloquent prose, an Anthropocene trespassed human non-human boundary is brought into the same frame of reference as the digitally trespassed non-human human of the new digital financialized capitalist world. Dipesh Chakrabarti has just uh, remarked on his slightly different take on the planet, which is much more deeply in conversation with Earth System Science. And his and Baucom's uh, view of planetarity, I think, brings, post brings to post-colonial theory a radically different materialist, political, and historical understanding of the planet than what we've encountered thus far. In fact, as, as, as he remarked, uh, uh, post-colonial theorists have always been better prepared, as he said, to deal with the heat generated by, uh, by global warming than by, uh, or the heat generated by capitalist globalization than by the heat generated by global warming. It is clear, however, that the two are overlapping processes. Post-colonial theory's relevance to the historical present hinges, I would argue, on analyzing the contemporary, our contemporary, as an assemblage an intersectional and relational matrix of imperial and anti-imperial processes visualized in the context of both the globe and the planet. It is not simply a matter of overwriting the globe with the planet. I don't think it's as, it, it, it's quite as simple as that. The two exist in tandem, whether we like it or not. And I mean them as conceptual categories. One of the most enduring and alive arenas of post-colonial theory has been a scholarly revelation that processes of minoritization, whether we look at the marginalization of Muslims and Dalits in India, of the Jews in Europe, that, that experiences of minoritization can be understood under the master sign or with the, under the master sign of colonialism. But these discourses of human difference have now to be brought into a conversation with an acknowledgement of human being species character as a geological force, as it were, while remaining attentive to the interrogative history of quotidian slights and political injury. Postcolonial theory today, I submit, must be a toggle between what Francois Hartog calls the different regimes of historicity, the planetary, the global and the local. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm introducing uh, Ashil Nibembe. is a research professor of history and politics at the Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research in Johannesburg, South Africa and a visiting professor in the Department of Romance Studies at the Franklin Humanities Institute, Duke University. He has also held appointments at Columbia University, Berkeley, Yale University, and the University of California. In the spring of 2016, he will be uh, 
visiting professor at Harvard University. Ashil Mimembe's research interests lie in the social sciences and African history and politics. More precisely, Mibembe investigates the post-colony that comes after decolonization. He is especially interested in the emergence of Afro-cosmopolitan culture, together with the artistic practices that are associated with it. Well, the floor is yours, Professor Mbembe. Yeah, thank you very much, Icy. Um, I think that uh, Adipesh and, and Roshan have done um, very important uh, work. Um, and I would like to um, write my, my own uh, intervention uh, along uh, the lines they have uh, so generously uh, opened uh, for us. Um, as Roshana mentioned, uh, I'm one of those who have been using uh, the term uh, the planetary, uh, not the planet. Um, and, and, and I have to blame it on, in my case, I have to blame it on, on Depeche, uh, as well as uh, uh, Paul Gilroy. Uh, I thought uh, it was the ones who, <laughs> you knew it was coming and, and here it is. And I, I'm absolutely serious. I mean, um, the, uh, the idea of the planetary uh, Paul Gilroy, I, I read the, the piece by Gayatri Roshana was, was mentioning. Um, and of course, Walter is uh, in, in the room, quote unquote, uh, he, he has to share uh, uh, part of the, the blame uh, too. Um, I, I came to that term um, not, not unwillingly, but, but um, um, using it formally uh, has not, I have to uh, uh, confess, um, allayed all the, um, the concerns I, I still harbor with, with the term. Um, concerns which um, originate <clears throat> Uh, from uh, the ways in which um, it is now nowadays used almost interchangeably uh, with other categories such as uh, the earth, uh, such as uh, the world, uh, such as the cosmos, or even so uh, the universe. So, so it seems to me that a, a starting point uh, should be the kind of clarification uh, which needs to be, to be made between these uh, different uh, terms. Uh, clarification, I think Dipesh himself and Roshana have uh, already uh, uh, started to, to, to make. Let me just uh, maybe add to what they, they said. When we say the earth, do we only refer to the geological magma filled rock we know of? Or uh, do we include physical uh, phenomena uh, such as uh, the plants, uh, animals, uh, or the minerals? When we use the term world, are we trying to describe um, an imaginary boundary surrounding each individual? Uh, if so, does such a, a boundary also encompass uh, the physical world and uh, entities and, and the experiences unique to, to the individual? Or, or do we... Uh, mean all life on that rock called the earth, human life as well as the life of the plants and others. And then finally, when we use the term universe, do we imply the, the physical planets and atoms or do we include the uh, metaphysical and spiritual aspects contained therein. 
I think we have to ask those questions and not because they have a definitive answer, but because precisely they reveal a tension in the concept itself, which we need to hold on to, a, con a tension that is in fact, uh, uh, to some extent, and, and resolvable. Uh, we have to do that also because using all these terms as synonymous uh, can only be done at, at the expense of the vastly differential spatial, political uh, and ethical uh, implications as uh, Roshana and, and Dipesh have uh, suggested. Now, Roshana uh, took the risk of uh, <laughs> telling you about what I, I mean by the planetary. And I don't disagree with that, Roshana. I would just like to add a, a little, little point uh, uh, as a complement to, to what you shared with us. Part of me tells me that the planetary is not only the, the biophysical, the bioorganic and mineral order, uh, if you want. It's not only the, uh, what we could call the global collective of the humanity. Part of me tells me that the planetary has something to do with what we can call the living world. The term in French is le vivant. I translate it in English as the, uh, the living world. The living world in its uh, multiplicity and the living world as it undergoes its endless process of transformation. A transformation which has no Omega point. A transformation which is not supposed to reach an apex or uh, to reach ultimately any moment of unification. So uh, this living world, which for me stands for the planetary, in what is it that it includes? Of course, it includes, let me just use that term here, all creation, both in its theological dimension, creation, and in its technological dimension, the making of things and artifacts. It includes all the people of the world, the artificial creations or works of humanity, the mass of things, humanity has invented, animals, plants, minerals, all mixed bodies, if you want, the whole physical universe, of course. All of that is consistent, it seems to me, with the definition of the living world, which once again stands for me as the planetary. So this is what I would add, Roshana, to what you, uh, you so beautifully uh, said. Let me now move to two other quick comments and I, I will stop. The first comment, the second comment uh, is that there are, of course, various drivers of the process of planetarization in our time. But I would like to highlight two of these. Something I call broadly speaking, the market and the other thing, technology. So what I would like to do in the few minutes that remain is to comment a little bit on the uh, relationship, which seems to me to be unfolding between what I would call market futures, techno futures, 
and the futures of life. Because it seems to me that the planetary in our times is played out at the interface between these three forces of uh, futurity. I mention uh, the market because to a large extent, the market does not only aspire today to become a totality, it has always aspired to become a totality. Today it does so in uh, an escalated way, if you want. It does not only aspire to become a totality, it also aspires to become our core moral experience, no matter where we are, with differential intensities, of course. But it's not only the market that is aspiring to become our core moral experience. Technology does too. So both the market and technology now set the rules and the procedures according to which we are obliged to live together as a collective body within new uh, planetary limits, uh, Dipesh and Roshana mention these new planetary limits. And this we see in the multiplication of uh, the digital ecosystems, which uh, when we put them all together, nowadays form what is known as platform capitalism. Platform capitalism of which uh, we might want to say two or three quick things. First of all, the fact that uh, uh, these plat platforms are distinct infrastructural ecosystems and as such, they are experienced as everyday environments. Uh, the fact that uh, what unites them is not only the way they capture value from transmissions and interactions of, of digital media and technologies, but also the way in which they capture data. Um, and uh, I say all of this because uh, key, it seems to me, to the operations of, of these platforms is indeed the uh, mobilization of data. Uh, the mobilization of data having become an essential part of the circulation uh, of, of capital at uh, speeds we have hardly ever seen before. The point I really want to make is that to account for the planetary in our times, it is absolutely crucial to uh, put one's finger on the extent to which we are increasingly surrounded by multiple and expanding wave fronts of calculation. In the sense that techne is becoming the quintessential language of reason. And uh, the fact that uh, Techne is becoming the quintessential uh, language of reason interrogates profoundly the whole project of the humanities. And it is the expression of a shift that is going on, the shifting distribution of powers between the human and the technological. All of this in the sense that uh, Technologies are moving towards a general intelligence and replication that we have witnessed over the last decades, the development of uh, algorithmic forms of intelligence, which have been growing in parallel with genetic research and often uh, in its uh, alliance. Now, uh, the integration of algorithms 
and big data analysis in the biological sphere is not only bringing with it a greater and greater belief in techno positivism and modes of statistical thought, it is also paving the way for, for regimes of assessment of the natural world and modes of prediction analysis, which treat life itself as a computable object. Uh, an object that can be construed by our statistics, uh, metadata, modeling, and financial models. Uh, I think that this is a, a key challenge to the humanities, and the belief that everything is potentially computable and predictable. It is a key challenge because underlying such a belief is a rejection of the fact that life itself is an open system, uh, non-linear and exponentially chaotic. And um, a planetary library or a planetary curriculum in that context would be one, seems to me, whose uh, strategic project would be to understand the incalculable and the incomputable. And this can only be based on the will to go beyond cognitivism. Let me end with uh, one or two key questions. It seems to me a planetary curriculum uh, would have to address. One key question is the following. What remains of the human subject in an age when, as I just argued, reason tends to manifest itself mostly through information machines and technologies of calculation? A second question is who will define the threshold or set the boundary that distinguishes between the calculable and the incalculable, the computable and the incomputable. And one last question is whether we'll be able to invent different modes of measurement, modes that open up the possibility of a different aesthetics, a different politics of inhabiting uh, the earth, a different politics of repairing and sharing the planet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your thought provoking uh, commentary. Uh, I'm introducing uh, Walter D. Mignolo, who has been the William H. Wanamaker Professor of Literature and Romance Studies at Duke University, USA, and has joint appointments in Cultural Anthropology and Romance Studies. He has published extensively on semiotics and literary theory, and has in the past years been working on different aspects of the modern colonial world and exploring concepts such as global coloniality, the geopolitics of knowledge, transmodernity, border thinking, and di-plurivalities. Mignolo co-edits the web dossier, Worlds and Knowledges Otherwise. He is the academic director of Duke in the Andes, an interdisciplinary program in Latin American and Andean studies in Quito, Ecuador, and the Politecnica Salesiana University. Since 2000, he has directed the Center for Global Studies and the Humanities, a research unit within the John Hope Franklin Center for Interdisciplinary and International Studies at Duke. He has also been named permanent researcher at large at the Universidad Andina, Andina Simon Bolivar in Quito, Ecuador. Yes, Professor Mignolo. I think you have to turn, unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very fascinating presentation. I will 
Can I share one slide? I would like to start with that, just one. Let's see if I can. So just uh, let's start with, uh, <clears throat> I think of what, <clears throat> what Ashil brought at the beginning with the question of the planetary and the cosmos and the universe brings a larger problem that is that we are trapped, we in the academy, we are trapped in the vocabulary of Western civilization. And that is, I think, the problem that uh, Ashil was addressing, uh, exploring the meaning of the different worlds. And the interesting things that I find in his exploration is when he began to define the planetary as a kind of le vivant or the living organism. It's very interesting because it goes, it runs parallel what, what indigenous cosmology has always thought. There is no novelty for them. <laughs> and it's also like uh, uh, the biology, the neurobiology of uh, uh, people like uh, Umberto Maturana, uh, Chilean, all we thought. So I start with that because uh, planetary uh, uh, humanity, we have to kind of do the same kind of exploration that Ashil did with the universe with the, uh, the term human, humanities, uh, humanism, etc. So uh, that is very, very well known, the term Studio Humanitatis is a Renaissance uh, uh, concept that ran through Western civilization and then <clears throat> is kind of exported, imported with expansion, with colonial expansion. So the second, the second part is less known, but um, but it's the notion of the humanities was based on classical model, the tradition of liberal art curriculum conceived by the Greek and elaborated by C uh, Cicero and Quintilian, which means that um, we are trapped not just in the vocabulary, we are trapped in the six modern European imperial languages, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, mainly in the Renaissance, French, German and English, especially now. And all those languages are grounded in Greek and Latin. Greece, of course, is not the property of the West. Uh, Muslim philosopher dealt very much with uh, the Greek. Uh, Christianity is not the property of the West, but we forget about uh, Orthodox Christianity that ran from Greece to uh, Moscow. So the concept of the human and the humanities is, is a very problematic because it's the measuring stick for a, not only a measuring stick for classification and hierarchies of the rest of the people and the rest of the planet. The planet in the sense Earth, uh, not, not go into the ghetto, uh, the details. So I think that the planetary humanities in that simple uh, concept of uh, have to kind of examine that. We cannot just leave those things uh, untouched. And why? Because, um, because humanity, the, the concept of the human and the concept of humanity, the concept of the human is the standard, the measuring stick for racism and sexism. And the concept of the human is also limited to the human species. The concept of the human cut the relationship with the, earth, with the earth and the cosmos. So that was never done in many cosmologies that were kind of contemporary to the Renaissance. Uh, that is, uh, the best knows in India, uh, still in Africa, I know in South America. And those have not 
they are not the way of thinking of the past. They are now this kind of, so Western, Western humanities belong to a type of cosmology, so of, of a specific cosmology that became dominant and destituted other cosmology, including the value of the concept cosmology. And I think that uh, a human, a, a planetary humanity at this point have to uh, think about the restitution of what has been destituted in the constitution of Western civilization and Western modernity. I think that Roshan and, and, and Lipesh and Achille touch about that. So I just kind of given my kind of perspective from the South, the South of the Americas and the South of the Americas is very different also from the South of Europe. So when we talk about the epistemology of the South, we have to make it this kind of distinction. So the concept of the humanity constituted a, a given image of the human species, as I said before, destituting. So that is a kind of the pillar of the imaginary of Western civilization. And the other is the map. Because the, the, the idea that the, uh, the page was, uh, and Ashir uh, also uh, were touching, is with Mercator, 1542 and Ortelius 15, uh, 17, uh, 1570 that the human species has for the first time a total image of earth. Now, well, of course, we have, uh, we have uh, pictures, etc. cetera, from, from the space. No? But if, if we talk about, uh, go back to the concept of the human, uh, for example, in Quechua Aymara, Ren, uh, Runa, you cannot translate runa as human because runa is conceived in a constant movement of life in relation to earth and the cosmos. And if you translate as human, you destitute. And that is what happened. You destitute. And the same thing happened with other concepts uh, 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 in Africa and Asia, but, but take this, for example, Ren in, in, in Chinese. I mean, Chinese is all under heaven. It's not just a kind of, uh, a, some kind of a species of the living that is uh, separated uh, from the Ren. So that is one of the points that I would put for conversation of our planetary. The second is the very institution of the, the, of the university. I cannot separate the, um, uh, the humanities from the universe. To run very quickly, uh, probably a history that you know, but to run very quickly, uh, the university that is a medieval creation, the Bologna University, but then is transformed uh, radically during the Renaissance. And then is when the Studia Humanitatis emerged because the, the medieval university was theological, <clears throat> but the Studia Humanitatis brings the humanist into the picture that are the kind of the, <coughs> the uh, what will run into, uh, uh, into the secularization in the 18th century. But at that time in the Renaissance, the 16th, 17th century, things were still kind of mixed. And even Descartes has to kind of uh, apologize to or just address God <laughs> for justification of what, uh, whatever, but he, he has to do it. Um, so the university, the university of the Renaissance um, is a problem because the universe of the, the university of Renaissance, um, at the same time that constitutes itself, destitute other form of knowing and education in what we call the new world. So for example, Jachaiwasi uh, among the Incas. Jachaiwasi, <coughs> Jachai means knowledge or knowing, that is a kind of translation. And Wasi, uh, house, house of knowledge. Uh, and then we have the Amauta, and the Amauta was uh, translated as philosopher. Uh, Amauta was an uh, elder and elder uh, women or men or men, women who were kind of uh, a person of, of knowledge uh, that this is still respected today, but it's kind of destituted from uh, the institution. So <clears throat> if we look at what happened in, uh, in the 16th and 17th century in the new world, 
then we see that that will happen in Africa and, uh, and, and Asia. So the institution or university will be exported, imported, right? And the exportation, importation, uh, the collaboration in the kind of, uh, in, 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 the, in the given places, uh, contribute to a uh, destitute, uh, long lasting institution, actors, languages, and knowledge. I know that when we was, uh, will be here tomorrow, and I would like to kind of uh, listen to him because he wrote this kind of fabulous uh, four volume on, on Chinese thought. And so what I see those four volumes of Chinese thought is precisely the need of restituting, uh, reconstituting what has been destituted. Uh, <clears throat> So the, 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 the European University have this kind of a double, double history, but one history, one part of the history is silence. So if I take just a new world, the new world. So the University of Santo Domingo was created in 1542, 45. The University of Mexico, 1555. The University of Lima, Peru, San Marco, 1558. Uh, the University of Cordoba, Argentina, 1575. And Harvard is the youngest, 1636. So that's a, uh, that is a kind of the uh, obscure uh, kind of um, uh, history of the university, uh, of the university that, um, that we have to think about <clears throat> because that brings me to the third point. Um, and it's the question of the geopolitic of knowledge, not just the geopolitic of knowledge. Uh, I think John at the beginning was uh, mentioning that uh, the domination of the Western Academy, the North Atlantic Academy, but also the North Atlantic languages uh, into, um, into the conversation. So I think that the geopolitic of knowledge and knowing is a, for me, is a fundamental issue to address in what we call for the time being, uh, the Planetary Academy. Uh, and I agree with Ashil with all the concern we have to have because of the technology and capitalism working together and the data, etc. But I believe that there are way out. There are, I think that uh, what the big data does is a tremendous silence and destitution of oral, of oral relations of oral communication, of being together. And in this sense, I think that uh, the, um, the uh, planetary, one of the issues that the Planetary Academy should address is how the concept of the social destituted the communal. And one of what well, I call that the kind of decolonial uh, task, one of the decolonial tasks is reconstitution of the communal which is, uh, is not the common, it's neither the common, uh, neither, no, nor the common, neither, neither the common nor uh, the, common, the common well, that the kind of uh, liberal and Marxist uh, uh, articulate the kind of uh, organization. But I mean, we know uh, liberal and, 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 and Marxist and neoliberal and neo-Marxist, they belong to the same cosmology. So they belong to the same cosmology of the social that destitute the communal. And I don't know if I will call that humanities or not because of the problem of the term uh, uh, humanities, but I think that uh, the reconstitution of knowing and form of knowing and form of living, of kind of reconstituting our kind of relationship with earth uh, and with the planet, and we have a lot to, to, uh, to, to learn there uh, from indigenous people, not to go to the, uh, to the pristine past as a friend of Ashil and, and myself said, uh, but this is part of futurity. Because if we don't see that as a kind of futurity, the kind of re-establishing, reconstituting the communal in, in, in our relation to, to life, uh, we will just remain trapped into uh, into the big uh, into the big data uh, into the market, and I think that 
the big data and the market cannot cover all of the spaces in planet Earth. And it's up to us, the human species, to kind of claim this fracture, this kind of spaces that are, cannot be controlled by the data, uh, by the data and, and, and capitalism. And um, so I will uh, I will end with a uh, with a with a question, no, with a point and the question. I think that uh, Roshana and uh, and Dipesh and and Ashil uh, uh, provide a lot of um, arguments and uh, information to make for me easier to say this. I think we in the planet today are. Are, uh, are living, experiencing a change of era and no longer an era of change. So the post is out of place. So uh, the cycle 1500, uh, 2000 is closing. Something different is opening. And I will put it this way. Um, since the, 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 the Gathier Revolution, the emerging ethno class that we call the bourgeoisie, the white European bourgeoisie, took over the world. And that is more or less what Carl Schmidt called the second nomos of the earth. I think that we are today in the opening of the third nomos of the earth. And the third nomos of the earth is that what the bourgeoisie can no longer control unless we want to become part of the, of the bourgeoisie. So my, my question is this, can the Planetary Academy be less academic? I think what has been said at this, at this point, uh, kind of move into that direction. I say stop there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm moving on to our uh, final speaker, uh, Privat Docent, uh, Dr. Henning Truper, is a historian of modern Europe with specialisms in the history and theory of the humanities and the history of humanitarianism. He works as a researcher at the Leibniz Center for Literary and Cultural Studies, Berlin, where he currently heads the ERC project, Archipelagic Imperatives, Shipwreck and Lifesaving in European Societies since 1800. His latest book publications are Orientalism, Philology, and the Illegibility of the Modern World, 2020. And in German, please uh, excuse my mispronunciation, Maybe you can kind of correct me. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. No worries. Yes. Okay, Soshen 2021 on the implications of the year of the plague. Well, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, also very much for the, for the opportunity to be on this uh, fascinating panel. Um, I uh, of course, I mean, the, the position as the last speaker is, uh, is ungrateful in so many regards uh, because so much has already been said and I will probably make a bit of a mess of it because I'm cutting things as I'm going from my notes and I'll add things as I'm going. So it's, uh, it's um, going to be, yes, a little bit disorganized more so than I would have hoped, <clears throat> but uh, exactly as much as I expected. Um, Right. I will approach the topic a little bit also from the uh, perspective of the humanities side of it, less uh, the perspective of the planetary. Um, and um, I think my starting point for approaching it was a little bit um, yeah, less uh, philosophical, maybe, but kind of practical about the sort of naive intuitions that certainly nobody in the present company, but... Uh, perhaps some colleagues, and certainly in a, in a weird way, I myself have about the practice of, uh, of 
yeah, doing humanist scholarship, and I um, share many of the concerns with the terminology, of course, that have been brought up. Um, but I will just uh, deploy it without criticizing um, the terminology so very much. And um, I'll try and get through this. Um, I have called this thing basically three wig histories of the humanities and their blind spots. And uh, I think they have some significance for the, for the project. Um, now, first, um, I think it's probably going to be important to consider the, the side of the disciplinary, right? The, as as uh, what Mignola says, the side of the university also, but the side of the way the, the well, the disciplines are actually organized, um, the way they function, the way lots of people function within these disciplines. Um, so there's all these questions about the internal diversity of humanities research programs and infra and interdisciplinary struggles of hierarchization, matters that concern oppositions that we've, uh, we've heard about, so the planetary versus the global, but also the global versus the national or the local. Uh, there's issues to do with contemporary versus non-contemporary, um, metropolis and periphery, macrocosm and microcosm, social sciences, humanities, quantification, and hermeneutics. Um, and I, I think one probably also needs to acknowledge that the sort of working mode of a lot of the humanities today uh, is, um, I mean, sort of reactive to all the critique of the humanities as well. So all these uh, histories of power and abuse and of omission and ignorance and deliberate uh, in exclusion and the uh, sort of separation uh, from the planetary, um, all of that um, is sort of integrated into a sort of uh, intuitive, expansive pluralism. Right? One basically says, yes, and we'll take that in uh, also. Um, and there is a sort of movement of differentiation and of every emerging novel spaces and fields of research that uh, does take the form of an implicit Whig history of the uh, humanities that nobody quite bothers to tell, I think, although perhaps some people do, it's hard to keep track, but um, and this, this is a sort of Whig history of the present of the humanities. And um, the idea is basically that they somehow get better by uh, increased inclusivity, which can also mean dropping certain things that are not deemed, uh, you know, workable anymore. Um, and um, it's interesting to me from the, from the uh, outline of the project that um, global perspectives were clearly meant to do this, but they reproduced, as the organizers rightly say, certain pre-given hierarchies, um, centers, periphery, and so on. And now we introduce, in a sense, the planetary to fix these issues, right? And uh, there is a the way in which this is contiguous with the with the Whig history of uh, you know expansionary pluralism. Um, the um, the danger is, of course, that in a sense this movement might reproduce the same results, right? Uh, and perhaps that's not even a danger because the blind spot of this Whig history, I think, is that uh, of course humanities research, as it stands and has been practiced for a long time has this one feature also that it is actually apparatic. So if we look at the uh, expansion of uh, technology and science as supporting technology, we see a sort of um, yeah, a, a massive linear expansion in a certain sense or um, something like that, right? But in the humanities, on the other hand, one gets a lot of research projects that uh, are abandoned. There used to be this, uh, I think it's gone out of fashion, but the rhetoric of turns, for instance, that uh, turned out to be turns to not really anywhere but the weeds, and then basically one doubles back and starts in a new direction. And again, it ends in aporia, and there are these massive cycles of enthusiasm, uh, the creation of uh, intermittent great books, and, uh, and uh, basically forgetting, right? And um, that is not a position of despair, I think, but uh, actually something that is really interesting in, in many regards. And um, is something that the, the academy probably ought to address because there is a, a question there as to whether this uh, dynamic cannot also be manipulated to create uh, yeah, sort of different directions, right? If one, if one is aware of it, maybe one can uh, um, alter the course a little bit and not reproduce quite so much. So there is really a sort of plea to be had also for a more history of the humanities within this academy. Uh, also, 
of course, in the sense of, uh, well, what I mean, your question of how to de-academize it, for instance, right? That is certainly quite uh, significant. Um, but it's also something that actually speaks to the question of the futurity of the humanities in a, in a sense, right? So what is the imagination of the future here? And uh, do we actually accept or do we not accept the idea that we might end up in another aporia? Um, 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 just one footnote to this is that, of course, the, uh, the heinous project economy that the uh, a academy is generally subjected to now. This actually feeds into this as well, because uh, in a sense, the project is always about the beginning of the project. It's not really about the end of the project, right? So the the results are not so significant for the for the project form. Um, the second thing that I was going to say uh, is that there is a this this issue of pluralism is uh, connected to. Um, a, a, a widespread sense of unease that has to do with this uh, direction of, um, you know, these two big issues of the planetary, which are, of course, the expansion of global capitalism on the one hand and the Anthropocene on the other, which are two sides of the same coin. It's hardly an original point to, to make. And, of course, there's a lot of uh, human, humanity scholars that uh, feel very panicked about this in the sense of uh, feeling that they don't really have anything to contribute, to, right? And... Uh, I mean, Dipesh has done, of course, tremendous work in pointing out that there are ways of doing that. Um, but still, I think a lot of people feel that that will not be not be easy for them, let's say, given the disciplinary location that they are in. Uh, what probably doesn't um, um, preoccupy people quite as much as that I think that capital, capitalism, that expansion has a pretty similar status. So the shocking otherness of the, uh, of, of the planet, so to speak, as, as Dipesh was saying, is, uh, is something that capital also has. It's really shocking the other and all, uh, well, I mean, the hegemonic way of writing uh, histories of capitalism, I think now is really also about uh, trying to, to deal with that uh, otherness um, in a sense that, um, well, I mean, so that the normal operating mode uh, that this, uh, attitude I think takes is uh, to do with um, critique. So critique is um, basically the, the uh, refuge of, uh, of humanities uh, that deals with these issues. And this is very much, uh, has, been, has been an operating um, yeah, uh, well, paradigm in a way for a long time, right? I would think of maybe the, the early Frankfurt School critical theory, the humanities are there to find these kinds of pockets of resistance to and the residual spaces of exemption from this dynamism of, uh, of power and uh, capital. And um, the, the pressure on the humanities to develop increasingly critical perspectives toward this expanding macrocosmic environment uh, has been driven by the self-understanding. And it's, it's interesting if one looks at the history of the humanities just in the modern era is that the, the self-understanding of them as a form of critique is quite recent in a sense. It's really a 20th century thing and a post-war thing. Uh, previously, there were, of course, critical uh, scholars, but they were always very marginal. Um, and... Uh, my suspicion is, it's not a very nice suspicion, but my suspicion is that this is another sort of weak history of the humanities, although darker one, uh, not the weak history of the expanding pluralism, um, but the weak history of um, humanist critique as resistance as being in a sense always on the right side of history, even if it's the losing side. Um, and this weak history too has its blind spot, which is the question of the possible co-optation of critique. Um, and the ways in which political cultures process critique have been well certainly multiplied. I mean, if one looks at the early period of the Frankfurt School and today, the way that uh, sort of institutional bodies integrate kinds of things uh, has, has probably changed dramatically. And um, I have this, this uh, awkward suspicion that academy, well, the academic humanities nowadays often function in a form of control laboratory for critique. Now that is even driving it to certain extremes, but also containing it. Right? And um, in that sense, really, this, the, the, the critique of the, of the academy is, uh, is something that has to be included, I think. Um, there is also this issue about the university as such that, um, I mean, on account of its enormous expansion over the last 
50, 60 years, something like that. Uh, it, it really has become this huge machine uh, that functions as a provider of cultural capital to those portions of societies that are aspiring to up social mobility. And the alternative to this kind of mobility has increasingly become uh, permanent economic redundancy, right? Uh, which uh, seems to be a prime marker really of, of the present. And uh, there seem to be many kinds of pressure on social mobility the world over, which uh, also regularly generate uh, sort of negative social responses. Um, but the symbolism of social mobility continues to hold, a, uh, to have a very a firm hold over people's imaginations in many places. And uh, critique in this way, actually, I think, is indirectly subjected to the forces of the market. It actually becomes, in a weird way, marketized as providing people with uh, standing within capitalist economy. And that is something that, uh, that is really, that one has to, has to think about as well. And um, if I may, briefly the third one, but I'm kind of running over time, I think. Um, you have to tell me. Well, you've got about a couple of minutes. Oh, do I? All right. Okay. okay. <laughs> in that case, in that case. Well, the, the, the question of redundancy is interesting, of course, because there's always this uh, sense in the humanities as a stand that, uh, um, in a sense, you know, the crisis of the humanities always uh, is phrased in terms of its uselessness. That's, uh, that's a very topical sort of thing to say, um, commonplace uh, in many debates. Um, there is, of course, a long history of government service of social sciences and humanities scholarship with one thinks, for instance, of something like area studies in the US and uh, during the Cold War. Uh, so that was really always about a sort of discursive hegemony and um, ideologically very um, pronounced environments. But it seems that the, uh, the uh, status of the ideological has somehow changed. It's at least a little bit my impression that uh, in a sense, the content well, there's, there's a lot more flexibility on the, on the substantial content that's being put forward and there's sort of more um, of an integration of the, yeah, well, maybe of the expansive pluralism that I mentioned earlier. And um, in a sense, maybe there is a sort of um, um, slippage of the awareness of the utility of the humanities. Um, because they don't seem to be so directly involved in these kinds of geopolitical undertakings. But uh, um, that's something that Dominic Zaxman also mentioned at the very beginning of the, of the uh, meeting before it actually went uh, online, is that, uh, I mean, the, the, this is really a, a significant issue, the question of geopolitical blocks nowadays, right? And how the humanities actually position themselves towards them. Um, there's, it's certainly something that is uh, significant for the digital formats that the academy will seek to uh, deploy because, of course, these technologies are owned. They are uh, accessible to state authorities in different ways. There is a question of how uh, they are, well, you know, implicitly policed. There's a question of implicit self-censorship and these kinds of issues. So that is something that the academy really will have to, to think about, I think. Um, now, anyway, just to briefly conclude the third week history in this regard, I think is this, that the, uh, the, the notion that the humanities are becoming um, less useful at the same time as they are becoming smarter about previous ways in which they've been used, right? So there is a, a sort of linkage between cleverness and uselessness and the way a lot of humanist uh, academics think about themselves. Uh, and um, I think the blind spot then is the, the geopolitics of the humanities now and the question of how they might actually still be useful in ways that they don't notice. So in a sense, they aren't as smart as they think sometimes and uh, they're not as useless as they think. Right. So that's, uh, that's basically yeah, what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. What happens now? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I see. Like, um, yeah, thanks a lot to all these wonderful presentations. They were truly really thought provoking. And uh, for the, so I thank all the panelists for, for their reflections. 
and of course, Dr. Isenbel to, for chairing this uh, panel. So now well, to the general audience. Oh yeah, sure. So just to the general audience, uh, to this panel, uh, this online panel will continue tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Central European time. So we will end now the live broadcast and uh, please 